On November morning of 1953, impatient men started to flock around a beer joint in a remote neighborhood of Kyiv, dreaming of a mug of beer to help reduce effects of heavy hangover. Their hopes were in vain, though. The place was closed. One of the most feverish customers peeked inside to see a dead woman lying in a pool of blood. The victim was a bartender, Margarita Karatsupa, a.k.a. Queen Margot. The death was a result of a deep cutting wound on her throat. A tattooed flower was found on her stomach. A woman with a tattoo was a very rare occurrence in the 50s and could only mean her ties with the criminal world. A distinctive bloody palm prints on the floor and the bouquet of daisies to the left of the body could be seen. Obviously, the attack was not unexpected. A bottle of Armenian brandy, two glasses, one with traces of lipstick, led to conclude that the murderer enjoyed the bartender's favor. Her accounting book with a few small bills in was lying on the counter. The dissection of carotid and trachea caused rapid blood loss. Most likely the killer was a professional. During World War II, scouts would apply such strikes to soundlessly neutralize guardsmen. Detectives assumed that the crime was committed by a war vet. A rumor about the murder of Queen Margot quickly reached her workmate, who showed up at the crime scene at once. She had no idea of who might kill, but said that their customers are diverse and include both ex-military and outright thugs. She recalled a recent incident when a drunk customer, Misha, the sailor, demanded vodka from Margot. He had no money and he left his watch as collateral. Margot recorded the 100 ruble debt in her logbook and warned that if he fails to pay back tomorrow, the watch will be gone. The woman doubted that Misha could have killed over the pledged watch. She added, however, that when the guy was drunk, he was unpredictable. Other frequenters added more details to the profile of Misha the sailor. The watch was his war award for bravery during the scout service. He was very proud of it. That's why, as soon as he sobered up next morning, he ran back to Margot to claim it back, yet unable to repay the debt. The bartender refused to return the watch. The sailor lost control, and the bar customers had to save Margarita from the crazed drunkard. It was quite common for Margot to sell booze against collateral. In her pursuit of revenues, she was not too picky, in fact. She dealt with petty crooks, lent money at interest, and didn't even feel squeamish about buying stolen items. The last record in her logbook spoke of Misha the sailor. Her workmate noticed that an expensive brooch was missing from the victim's blouse. The last day's revenue, which normally amounted to 5,000 rubles, was not found either. It looked like the murder was committed with the purpose of robbery. Bartender Margarita found murdered by professional stabbing. The cash desk is empty. All the victim's jewelry, including the expensive brooch, are missing. A pub frequenter, Mikhail Geshko, an ex-Marine during World War II, is a prime suspect. His conflict with the bartender went on for two days. It sparked over a watch which the man gave Margarita as a pledge for the sold booze. Detectives coming over to his place were met by his wife. Assuming that her husband returned as drunk as usual, she splashed water on one of the visitors. The officer went to the bathroom to put himself in order and saw a blood-stained sailor's robe soaked in a bowl. The wife explained, last Thursday she came home from work and found her husband dead drunk. She also noticed valuables missing and beat Misha up in outrage. That is where the blood comes from. He was checked into a hospital's traumatology ward. Detectives analyzed the timing. When the bartender was murdered, Misha was lying in a hospital bed. The suspicion had to be lifted. The forensic report said that as a result of the lethal throat cutting, a knife blade penetrated the esophagus and trachea and missed the spinal cord. A detective recalled his childish experience of watching a Jewish butcher abiding by all religious rules whereby an animal must be killed instantaneously and with complete exsanguination. The information was found irrelevant, though. After total extermination by Nazis, such specialists were unlikely to survive in Kiev. Alongside that, a bloody palm print was identified. 
It belonged to a Sergei Kirsanov having a criminal record. Fearing an arrest, Kirsanov attempted to escape. Upon detention, officers found the sailor's watch and Margot's necklace on him. The valuable brooch remained missing, though. Even without it, the motive for crime was evident. Kirsano swore he had nothing to do with the murder and knew nothing about the brooch. He confessed of breaking into the pub after its closing to steal some money and vodka. Bumping into the dead body, he freaked out and ran away. 30 minutes later, he decided to come back, however. He tore the jewelry off the victim, grabbed money from the cash desk, and snatched a few vodka bottles. On his exit, he slipped on the spilled blood, which explains the print of his right hand. He wanted to wipe his hand and saw the watch. Forensic experts established that the torn earlobes didn't bleed. The earrings were torn out eight, 10 hours after the murder. Further probes into the victim's entourage led the investigation to her lover, a bridge building engineer, Arkady Guzman. The man was fond of fencing, which meant that he was skilled in using cold weapons. The operatives failed to find him at home, but his neighbor explained that Guzman wasn't seen at home for three days. Earlier, the man had a bad fight with his mistress, Margarita. The curious neighbor went out into the hall pretending he was using the shared telephone. He didn't want to miss the passionate fight. Margarita, wearing a torn robe, tried to run away from the drunk Guzman, who attacked her with a knife in his hand. The neighbor had to intervene. He added that Arkady's rage was caused by jealousy. The quarrel erupted as Guzman blamed Margarita of cheating on him. During the conversation, Arkady showed up and immediately tried to escape. He was charged of Margarita's murder. Operators fished out three dozen condoms out of his pockets. The man claimed he knew nothing about the killing and only tried to conceal the stealing of condoms from work. Detectives didn't buy this explanation. How on earth are condoms related to bridge building? The engineer told, however, that patent bridge construction over the Dnipro River involves a brand new technology. Evgeny Paton Bridge is the world's first all-welded bridge, becoming one of the symbols of the Ukrainian capital. The construction began in 1940 on a personal instruction of Nikita Khrushchev, chairman of the Communist Party of Ukraine. The bridge was launched on November 5, 1953. The project required the use of 5,000 articles number two, as condoms were referred to in the Soviet Union. They were designated for charges waterproofing during explosive works. On the day of the murder, Guzman had an alibi. The bridge inauguration was around the corner. Works were underway for 24 hours. The man was on the site seen by everyone. He said that his fights with Margarita were over her repeated cheating and showed a postcard from Sochi he found at his unfaithful partner, reading, Kisses, Nadi. Detectives retrieved the postcard without hoping to find any fingerprints on it, but they were lucky. The glossy surface preserved fragments matching the fingerprints on the bottle of brandy. Her workmate was interrogated again. She didn't want to speak mean of the victim, but confessed that Margarita dated several men at a time. Besides the engineer, there also was a colonel who was transferred to a Far East garrison a few weeks ago, and an unknown meat purveyor, a war vet. Not a key resident, he only came on weekends and always gave Daisy's bouquets. The detectives latched onto this information. In the pub vicinity, flowers could only be bought at two spots, at a small florist shop and next to Lukyanovsky Cemetery. From a florist, they learned that indeed, there was a man buying daisies on weekends. He asked the florist to look after the tomb of Mark Stern, one of the few Jews who was shot but buried not in a common grave. Detectives established that before the war, Stern was a renowned butcher specializing in kosher butchering. A dead body of a bartender, Margarita Karatsupa, is found in one of Kiev corner pubs. Robbery is not considered as a plausible motive, as the money and jewelry were stolen by a perpetrator showing up in the pub when the victim was already dead. The prime suspect is a meat purveyor named Nathan, who could have had an affair with a bartender. 
The probe into meat collection outlets surfaced a shipping agent from Zhitomer, Nathan Neischuler. The entries made in shipping documents proved the identity of his handwriting with a message on the postcard from Sochi. Neischuler was detained on his way to the butcher's tomb in Lukyanovsky Cemetery. The detective recalled that he had seen the man wandering by the beer joint on the first day. Meanwhile, investigators obtained court materials related to the trial of Eric Klopp, head of the Berdichev Gestapo department. Margarita Karatsupa was an important witness testifying at the hearing on mass executions of Jews in the city of Berdichev. During the occupation, she worked at a diner of the Nazi's commandant office was part of the local resistance force. From December 1943 through the fall of 1947, many historic trials referred to as the Ukrainian Nuremberg took place in many cities of Ukraine, including Kharkiv, Poltava, Kyiv, Chernihiv, and Mykolaiv. Fifteen high-ranking Nazi officers were tried in Kyiv on the charges of participation in punitive operations against civilians, of forceful displacement of citizens to Germany, of mass executions and tortures. The prosecutor's indictment speech was broadcast on the radio. The criminals were executed by hanging on Kalinin Square, now named as the Independence Square, in front of 2,000 Kievans. The brooch found in Nan Schuler's apartment during the search was presented to him at the interrogation. The brooch belonged to the murdered Margarita. The suspect said that previously it had been his mother's brooch. No room for mistake, a handmade jewelry piece with a glass replacement of one missing emerald. In the 1930s, when Nathan was a teen, he extracted the precious stone to help famine victims. Being at the front line, he got a letter from his niece telling what happened to the brooch. The niece told that their family was blackmailed by a young lady named Maga, who demanded gold or else she would turn them all in to Gestapo. This Maga had a flower tattooed on her stomach. Nathan's mother surrendered everything, and yet Maga brought Nathan to their place. Nathan never thought he'd happen to meet this mysterious Maga. One day he came to a beer joint for a drink and saw his mother's brooch pinned to the bartender's blouse. Customers called her Margarita, sounding very similar to the name Maga. Nathan chose to get closer to the woman to learn more about her. He wanted to produce an impression upon Margarita getting a wad of cash from his pocket. He sent a local frequenter to get him a bouquet of daisies. The story didn't hold water, however. How could he have got a letter from his niece, who was killed? The suspect explained the letter survived accidentally. Before being shot, prisoners were stripped bare. The clothes would be shipped to Germany, but not this set of clothes. Nazis hastily retreated. Children's clothes were distributed across orphanages in the deoccupied territories. That is how the letter was found in a dress pocket. And uh, the military mail sent it to him. Neischuler paid several visits to Margot. He was really taking time. Once he came with brandy and flowers. After a drink, the bartender went on to kiss him. She unbuttoned her blouse, and Nathan saw the tattoo. It was her. He took a knife and skillfully, as a butcher's turn taught him, cut her throat. He tore the brooch off the blouse and left the pub. This case brought up the need to revisit some facts from the times of World War II. It turned out that Margarita was never involved in the resistance. She was holding several Jewish families in her basement in order to extort their valuables under threat of turning them in. Afterwards, she handed poor people over to Gestapo. Neischuler was sentenced to three years in prison for the committed lynching. Upon his release, he moved to Sakhalin, where his track was lost.